afternoon and good evening friends and welcome to this first webinar of uh, new year 2022 which is on the topic of uh, use of modular pre-engineered bridge systems on permanent emergency and temporary applications at the very outset i wish to convey my uh, very best wishes for a very wonderful peaceful and safe new year to all of you uh, we have passed through a very tough year and let us hope that the new year will bring happy times for all of us. Let me uh, introduce myself first at this point. My name is Alok Bhavik and I am the immediate past president of Indian Association of Structural Engineers and also chairman of the Professional Development and Technical Events Management Committee of uh, the uh, association. Today's uh, speaker uh, is uh, Mr. John Bren, Chief Engineer from Acro USA. He is an expert in the uh, field of design and construction of prefabricated modular bridges. Uh, the webinar will be moderated by Lieutenant General Ravi Shankarji, retired Director General from Border Roads Organization. He is a stalwart in the profession with immense experience of bridging under uh, extremely challenging circumstances. Friends, today's topic uh, is extremely uh, topical in the present scenario. We are seeing many emergency situations arising out of natural disasters or man-made disasters, where there is a demand to install bridges in uh, quick time, or in, in days or in weeks, to restore uh, connectivity. Frequency of such disasters are also on the rise uh, due to climate change issues. So uh, modular bridges is in demand and in such scenarios. Uh, this was realized by the uh, current uh, present uh, government also and the ministry. And in fact, they have directed the Indian Roads Congress to come out with a guideline on modular bridges. Modular uh, prefabricated steel bridges rely on a concept of modular units that are you know, bolted together in the field, thereby uh, eliminating any field welding and greatly increasing the speed of construction. The modularity uh, helps installation with small crews and light equipments, which also increases the uh, speed of construction and lessens the impact on the environment. Beyond that, of course, each bridge is custom engineered to meet the specific uh, loading requirements and even you know, different uh, skewed alignments and slopes, etc. There are uh, several myths uh, due to which the growth of these modular bridges is not uh, as much as we expect. Uh, it is important to address these myths. There is a growing belief that the modular prefabricated steel bridges are only temporary structures. Many people believe that even in our own fraternity, which is not true at all. In reality, uh, modular prefabricated bridges can be used and is being used as permanent bridges uh, in, in many places. The demand for modular prefabricated bridges are growing and we find that our codes and standards are not geared to address this demand adequately. It is therefore uh, important to understand the benefits of such bridges and to upgrade our codes and standards. We must prepare ourselves well in happy times so that when we are well prepared for the very difficult times when such disaster occurs. Friends, we are going to listen from an expert, Mr. John Brain, about the use of prefabricated modular steel bridge solutions for bridge construction. In today's presentation, we will learn from Mr. Brain the benefits of these modular bridges and how clients can quickly replace their aging bridge infrastructure with a safe and cost-effective solution. With this brief opening remark, I would like to now hand over this platform to the moderator of the day, Lieutenant General Ravi Shankarji. But before I do that, I have the proud privilege to uh, introduce him. Lieutenant General Ravi Shankarji is an alumnus of the National Defense Academy. He was commissioned into the Madras Sappers, that is Corps of Engineers, in March 1972. He retired as the Director General Border Roads in 2012 after 40 years in a variety of challenging appointments. He has 
wide experience in planning and execution of infrastructure projects, including roads and highways in difficult terrain, working under extremely challenging uh, circumstances. As on the Siachen Glacier, operating in hostile condition, including the UN mission in Somalia, and rehabilitation after major disasters such as the earthquake in Sikkim in 2011, where roads were opened in record time by the border roads. He was awarded the PVSM during his tenure with the border roads. Currently, as president in ICT, New Delhi, an infra consultancy company with an international footprint, he is overseeing various infra projects. He was instrumental in the planning and launch of the first new generation prefabricated modular panel bridge in Son, at Son Prayag in Uttarakhand, the first of this kind in India in record time, which enabled the Yatra to Kedarnath in Uttarakhand to commence on time in 2017. With this, uh, may I hand over this floor to Lieutenant General Ravi Shankarji to take this event forward. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Alok. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this. It is a unique event which is going to address uh, something which I definitely look at as a gap in national capability because we see many of the highways, they are built very fast, but in an emergency, we find the responses are definitely suboptimal. And many times a highway loses its uh, capacity to take double lane 70R traffic just because the patchwork done on it in an emergency is suboptimal. Uh, more of this towards the end. Uh, let's get on with the uh, discussion now. Uh, very briefly, we have with us on the panel, Mr. William Killeen. Uh, Bill Killeen is the CEO and chairman of ACRO. He joined ACRO in 1977. And over 45 years, he has worked himself up the ladder and become the chairman. And in the process, ACRO has also grown as one of the leading modular bridge companies. And they have gone on to acquire Mabe also. Uh, this will show you uh, how much of effort he has put in in modular bridges. Uh, Dr. Mahesh Tandon will join us as a panelist. He's not here now. He has joined, he comes, sir. He has already joined. joined. Yeah. He's joined? Yes, yes. Okay, I can see his thing. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Professor Mahesh Tandon requires not much of an introduction here in India. He is the past president of uh, IA Structures and managing director of Tandon Consultants Private Limited. Uh, he's considered as an international expert in the field of structural engineering. Many of the structures designed by Professor Tandon have been widely acclaimed and have received recognition in India as well as internationally. He's honorary fellow, Indian Concrete Institute president. President Indian Society for Wind Engineering, Intermediate Past President, and a whole lot of other distinguished appointments. He has accreditation of International Professional Engineers India too. Uh, <clears throat> he has been an inspiring force in any changes that has to come into the bridging industry. And I think uh, we are privileged to have him here on the panel. And today to deliver this talk on modular bridges, we have Mr. John Bryan. He's the chief engineer of Acro Bridge, a leading manufacturer of modular steel bridges. He has practiced structural and application engineering and product development, most of his career of nearly 30 years. He has served as the chairman for the American Society of Civil Engineers Construction Committee for temporary works in construction for 11 years. He currently serves as the subcommittee chair on temporary bridges, trestles, and platforms. He's also on several technical committees of the short steel span bridge alliance in the US. He has been with ACRO since 2013. So who better to talk to us 
on modular bridges. Over to you, John. Helps if, I, helps if I unmute myself here. So thank you very much for that, that introduction. And I want to thank everybody for um, your time this afternoon or this evening. And uh, we're going to, like uh, everybody has mentioned, we're going to go through panel bridging. So let me uh, get right into it and I'll share my screen here. Okay. So let's see. Can everybody see my screen falling? I want to make sure everybody can. And can everybody hear me? Okay. We, we're good. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah we are great. good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about the uh, modular pre-engineered bridge systems. Um, that's gonna be our, our, our theme and topic. So we're gonna just uh, just to give us a quick overview, we're gonna go a little bit about the history. Um, you know, these bridges sometimes are, are referred to as Bailey bridges because that's what we're gonna go through some of the history, which where that name came from and, and why they're called that. But really what we're gonna want to do is focus on today is really where the panel bridging systems have gone. In the last, you know, um, 20 to 30 years, the panel bridge system has become uh, more modular. It has become stronger. It has, uh, you know, we, we use this more higher grade steels than it was really designed to. And we can use it in almost any type of application, um, even beyond what we're gonna discuss today. There's other applications, which also we could use the systems for. But really today, I just really would like to focus on you know, where your market is with permanent emergency and temporary type structures. So we'll, we'll hop into the presentation. So, yep. so we're gonna go into uh, really the history advantage and applications first. So historically, um, you know, during, during the second world war, uh, the allies, uh, you know, in, in Europe mainly, uh, they, they realized that, you know, due to the, the heavy bombing and the heavy fighting that occurred in, in Western Europe, that a lot of bridges and roadways were uh, severely compromised or really uh, destroyed. And there were many, many rivers uh, that, that, are, that the soldiers had across. So the military leadership really needed some sort of method to, to get across, you know, across these, these uh, what we call uh, wet gaps or, or, or rivers, um, valleys, whatever the case may be. So really what they were looking for, uh, you know, they're looking for something that was pre-engineered, uh, something that could be delivered uh, really with the standard trucks of the day. You know, the standard trucks back in, in that time were re relatively lightweight when it came to, to loading and, and capabilities of carrying loads. And it also was very small. So they had to keep everything really modular, something that could be quickly erected by, by the troops, maybe with little or no training. And then um, they also to support uh, heavy vehicle traffic, so not just uh, tanks, but also uh, they would also need to support, uh, you know, uh, commercial, I mean, uh, you know, civilian traffic uh, with civilian trucks. So which sometimes could be heavier than, than, than a tank. It's, it's like two different loading cases. So uh, the original Bailey Bridge, and this is where it gets its name from, was developed by an English royal engineer by the name of Sir Donald Bailey. And what he created was a, a really an ingenious and simple structure. Uh, it was pre-engineered and very modular. It required no field welding or fabrication, which is really one of the, the, the key um, advantages of this type of system is these, these systems did not require any type of welding in the field or bolting. It was really, actually I should say there's bolting, but mostly it was, was a pin or simple connection just to make it as fast and, and modular as possible. It could carry a 40 ton tank, which was the standard tank weight at the time. It could be rapidly deployed and erected by hand. So they didn't necessarily need cranes or heavy equipment. Everything could be physically picked up by, by soldiers in the field and put together in a short period of time, including pushing uh, bridges across, uh, across a gap. They can physically push it with, uh, you know, with several companies of soldiers. It was very versatile. It could be assembled in all kinds of span lengths. It could be um, support any type of loading requirements. Because of the modularity, they could continue putting uh, our panel, all the panels to the sides and making the bridge stronger. They could double stack them. So whatever the design requirements were for at the time, they could actually physically do that with this structure. This is some of the, the pictures of what the original Bailey Bridge looked like. Uh, they were made in the UK, obviously, but then Time. Uh, in the 40s, it was they started being made here in the United States and 
and other uh, places within within the globe. There's a one and a little interesting tidbit when it comes to this. If there's a an old movie from the 19, I think it was the late 1970s or early 1980s called um, A Bridge Too Far, which is about the Battle of uh, Arnhem in in Holland. And in that movie, they actually show a unit assembling, pushing a bridge across uh, as, as part of the, uh, there's a small video clip showing the modularity and how the, the military use these bridges uh, during World War II. So just an interesting little tidbit there. Uh, so if you ever wanted to see it, I think you can probably find it on YouTube, that little clip, just type in, uh, you know, bridge too far. And uh, I think there's a clip that shows how the, the bridges were actually assembled and pushed during World War II. So after the war, uh, so post World War II, and I want to—it's kind of a, a big thirty-year uh, time frame here. You know, Bailey bridges continued to be manufactured, so it didn't stop with the end of World War II. Uh, you know, Bailey, Sir Donald Bailey and companies were still making these bridges. In fact, India is still manufacturing this type of bridge today. So you know, there are Bailey bridge types that are are made with several, I believe. Uh, uh, companies within India, and they are still using the original design from World War II, and, and they are making them still today. Uh, there's miles of World War II bridges uh, became available uh, to many governments as the army started selling them off. So as the infrastructure was replaced uh, in, in Europe and other places around the globe, the army took the bridges back. They had nothing really to do with them because there were so much, you know, so many miles of it. Then they started selling it to communities and countries, um, you know, here in the United States, they sold them to states. So uh, it became available to be used. Um, and at this time, the concept of uh, accelerated bridge construction and pre-engineered systems really didn't exist. This is something, a concept that's going to come, you know, another, you know, 30, 40 years down the road where we looked at how these bridges uh, could become uh, and used in accelerated bridge type construction areas. Uh, so again, these bridges, a lot of them, they went into rural areas, a lot of private developers brought them and, you know, there's bridges today that still exist. I know we've, we as ACRO have replaced some original World War II era bridges, I think on Canadian army bases and American army bases that were still, still there. And we've taken them out and even some local communities here in the United States, they, they, <laughs> You know, the, these bridges lasted 60, 70 years without a problem, and it was time to replace them. So, and in many cases, we replaced them back with the, the, the modern panel bridge. So, again, it shows you the, the flexibility and the longevity that these bridges can actually uh, do. <clears throat> so, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the panel bridge did find its niche in, in emergency bridging. Uh, you know, again, it goes back to some of Sir Donald Bailey's original concept, where you know, a, a bridge has failed, whether it be to overloading situation or uh, an accident or, or uh, also, you know, a natural disaster where, um, you know, these panel bridges could easily be borrowed from the military or borrowed from a state or you know, state uh, government and they could quickly uh, replace the bridge and get the, that area and, and not impact the local communities. You know, again, keeping commerce flowing and making sure that people can get back to their homes and also again, making sure that we had emergency equipment can get, you know, in many cases, a lot of these locations where they found they could put them, there were rather rural areas, which, you know, maybe the bridge uh, was washed out due to a, you know, a storm or whatever the case may be that the, uh, you know, the community no longer has access to emergency services, but they could easily put one of these bridges back into service, you know, within several days. And again, it doesn't impact the local communities. Uh, you know, due to their pre-engineered modular design, again, it allowed the quick replacement of these structures. And then in developing countries, there was an additional demand uh, for these types of systems that be shipped in ISO shipping containers, whether they be the standard 40 foot or 20 foot ISO containers. And that's really where we started seeing some of the modernization that we, we see today and, and how the bridge functions today. So from the 1970s to the present, so in the 1970s through really today, it, it, we're still looking at, at, at uh, you know, new product developments and new ways to, to use these systems. You know, it's evolving. Uh, the system, you know, we, we've, we're going to cover this on a couple of additional slides here coming up, is the systems we improve the modularity to maximize components. So reducing the amount of parts that go to a job site or to a, to a site, um, reusing components uh, maybe in different shapes or different functions. 
So again, we increase that modularity. Uh, higher strength steels were used. You know, it's, uh, you know, S450 steels are now common. So we went from the older, you know, 335 and, and, and lighter grade steels. Now we're using very high strength 450 steels in the bridge, which really increased the strength to weight ratio and can yield very, very long spans of 60 meters and more. You know, we've done span, simple span bridges up to about 80 meters, uh, depending on the roadway width or the carriageway width. So again, the system has now become much more flexible and we can do a lot more with it. Uh, originally, the Bailey bridges were painted. We, it was replaced with galvanization. So everything is now galvanized, which reduces your service, which increases your service life, reduces your maintenance costs, and also protects the environment because you no longer have to worry about going out and repainting these bridges in a permanent application. You know, over time, the paint is going to deteriorate. It's going to flake off. Uh, you, you're going to have to spend money to go out and, and basically repaint the structure. Galvanization doesn't really do that anymore. Now, again, once you get a, a galvanized structure out there, it lasts, you know, 75 to 100 years without a problem. Uh, Multi-lane bridges were developed. So originally the Bailey Bridge was a single lane structure for, for you know, military type vehicles. All the traffic was one going in one direction. Now we see multi-lane, you know, two, three lane structures, which can be done with the Panama Bridge. And then the more recent few, in the recent past, within the last, let's say 10 years, integral guide rail systems are now being developed. In many places in, in, in the globe, uh, these bridges are required to have an integral guardrail system that is uh, uh, either tested or uh, compliant to an impact forces by many state agencies. ASHTO requires us to design to uh, impact force here in the United States. So now we're seeing integral guardrail systems that are uh, part of the bridges. So we at ACRA, we have two different types of panel systems. They're basic, they're very similar. Uh, they're not identical, but they, they are almost identical. We'll put it that way. Um, one is uh, called the 700XS, and the other one is called the Compact 200. So uh, the 700XS is an Acro product. The Compact 200 is a Maybe product. Uh, they're not interchangeable, but they are interchangeable as to the fact that it can, they, both bridges can do the same thing. It's just the, the parts are not interchangeable amongst the two systems. But again, is, is where the um, Bailey Bridge, their panels are roughly 1.5 meters high. Our, the, the newer systems are now roughly, uh, was it uh, a little over 1.8 meters? I think it's 2.6 meters high, roughly, of, of, the, uh, of the panels. So the panels have become slightly deeper. They're still the same modular length, which is 10 feet, or roughly a little over three meters. Uh, that, has not, that was one of the, the nice uh, parts of the, the system is that the, it was built in, so we call a 10 foot uh, lengths, which was a standard uh, truck bed size back in the 1940s. And that's still, that is still the factor today because that's what makes us allow to be able to put everything into a, a, a 20 foot or a 40 foot shipping container. So some of the advantages of, of, of both of these systems, uh, it maintained that there's pre-engineered, it's modular and it's manufactured. We're gonna cover that in a little bit. So there's a difference between manufactured and fabrication. So these bridges are, are manufactured in a factory with, with robotic machines, which increases the, uh, you know, the, the quality control. You have a much, much higher grade quality product. Uh, we can support vehicle and train loadings in excess of 250 tons. So you know, not only can we do vehicular loading, we can also support rail loading at this, you know, uh, on, on, our, on our structures. Uh, we now have a steel orthotropic deck and we're, we're gonna cover that in a little bit. Galvanized finished. Uh, we can design to the local bridge codes, so we are not limited to where it's a 40-ton truck or it's not limited to an American code. We can actually design to any code in the globe as long as we, we have it on hand, which if we don't, we can get it, and we can design to that local code. So, for example, you know, uh, I have that we do have a job that, you know, we talked about or was mentioned earlier about the job in San Prayag. I actually was the engineer on that, and uh, because of that, I got very familiar with the Indian code. So again, is we can design any type of code. You know, we could do single lane, lane bridges uh, up to about 80 meters, uh, single span bridges, I'm sorry, up to about 80 meters, but we can also do multi-span bridges. So not are we limited to, to one span, but we've done bridges up to 10, 14, 18 or longer spans. So that's also very capable of the structure. It shows you the flexibility we can, can do with it. Uh, it's suitable for seismic regions. Our bridges are installed permanently 
in many seismic regions of the world. Not only do we have one up in, in, in San Prayag there in, in, in your country, but we regularly put them in California. Uh, we put them in, in South America and Chile and Peru, where there are also high seismic uh, requirements. So again, we could put them in there. Uh, we use them for uh, you know permanent, temporary, and emergency applications. So again, that's what's nice about this system. It could be used for almost anything uh, that could be where you need to put a bridge in. We could put our bridge in there as well. So you're not limited to, to that. Uh, again, we mean there's no field welding or fabrication at all. Everything is manufactured, gets shipped to the site uh, and ready to be installed. Uh, it can be rapidly deployed. Uh, by hand or using equipment. Generally today, we're using some sort of material handling equipment or MHE. It's versatile, so it allows us to basically still build in any length or width and load combination. So again, that's what makes this system so uh, advantageous over traditional concrete or steel types of construction that you may see for, for bridges. And again, we could these bridges can be delivered worldwide in shipping containers. We ship them from... Uh, I don't know, it's uh, from almost anywhere from, you know, your local port right out the, right out of the port we built them right up into, you know, the Himalayas or the, the Andes where they regularly take our bridges. We've also built them in Arctic regions. So again, it's, that's what's, what's nice about this flexibility is wherever you can get a, ship, like a shipping container in, we can get these structures in and built. And then uh, again, the local transport using about six meter lorries, which is pretty much standard for uh, what we call a road legal type vehicle. Okay, so just a comparison to some other bridge types out there, and this is more your traditional, you know, steel plate girder type or your your concrete type structures that you would um, traditionally look at for uh, a permanent a permanent bridge. So our these bridges are twenty five percent lighter than some alternatives, which again, will reduce your purchase price. So again, it, it, it brings that initial construction costs down significantly. It's significantly stronger in bending and shear, so we can do very long clear spans. It is a, even a, it is a truss, so it acts in that fashion as a truss. So again, we can get into some of those longer spans up to about 80 meters uh, for a single span. And like I said earlier, we can do multi-spans with whatever a site may, be, may require. Uh, there's many less parts, and you're going to see this shortly. There's only really three main components that are used in our in these bridges, with uh, some ancillary parts that can um, add some benefits to to your project. All our all everything is hot dip galvanized to resist the weathering. So we talked about it early. We don't have to paint. Let's see your uh, lower assembly costs and operating costs. So. You know, these bridges are, are, are built relatively quickly. So again, the contractor doesn't need to bring in, you know, a substantial size crew to pour concrete, set form work, put temporary shoring up. This bridge basically is built behind the abutment uh, with a small crew of about somewhere around uh, six to 10, 10 individuals and easily installed. Uh, of course, there's still foundation works that do need to be required, but again, it uses a rather small crew rather than having, you know, um, crews of, you know, 10 to 15, 30 individuals doing different tasks on site. Uh, quality assurance. This is a big one. You know, quality is a big, is a big thing uh, for, for us and, and globally with owners, you know, so for example, you know, our factories are ISO certified. Uh, we're AISC or American Institute of Steel Construction, major bridge uh, manufacturer or fabricator. And of course, we also meet Euro code CE and many other uh, quality assurance and quality codes out there. Uh, the bridges are made in the US or in England using locally sourced steels. You know, our bridges are all in the United States are all made from US made steel. And the same is, is in England. Uh, they're made from, uh, from some English steel, but also other uh, steels made in Europe. So again, we can, we can make to the highest quality steels that are available globally. There's a modern orthotropic steel deck. Uh, we're going to cover that in a little bit on what that would, that looks like, which comes with an anti-skid uh, surface already applied. So what's nice is you don't have to worry putting, you know, once you build the structure, you don't have to worry about putting an overlay on the bridge. It comes already on the bridge. And it's, it's simple. You put your deck panel on and you can literally open the traffic up several hours later uh, without having to worry about paving or, or applying any type of finishes. We talked about earlier, we do use high strength steels of both S450 and S350. So that's 
everything uh, within the system is made to those grades, uh, nothing really lower. Uh, we have much greater load capacity and there's less parts. And we're gonna cover those uh, with some upcoming slides. So we're gonna go into just three slides here that show or, and describe what, where we generally use these bridges, both permanent, temporary, and emergency situations. So permanent bridges, uh, again, uh, because it's very modular, we could use these to accommodate accelerated bridge construction. Uh, that, that's a big, I know it's a kind of a catchphrase that we see used lots of times now where, you know, we need to put in a new road or they need to put in a bridge rather quickly or a road rather quickly. And these bridges are perfect for that application. You know, they could simply build a road, put the foundations in and we can launch a bridge and have a bridge installed within several days and opened up to traffic to a region. Uh, because of its modularity, the length, width, and strength are easy customizable. And we'll, again, we could, a lot you'll see up in some upcoming slides, there's a lot of standard components that really will meet almost any application uh, that you're gonna be able to, to what we call throw at it. And we could simply uh, you know, meet your, your requirements. We could support millions of cycles of fatigue. You know, our, our bridges are designed generally up and, you know, up and above 200, sometimes 200 million cycles uh, of fatigue. So, and we have very little problems. Uh, and the way that the panel is designed, you know, we try to, to minimize the fatigue in the bridge itself just by the manufacturing process, the quality control process, and, and the, the basic design of the panel. Uh, conveniently transported to the remote, remote locations. We covered that a little bit while ago. Uh, it's fast and assembly to launch and challenging additions. We could easily put bridges, uh, you know, we, we've done bridges where say it's a 60 meter span. We could be, we could easily build it in, in only about uh, 50 meters. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not 50 meters, back up a second. Apologize about that. <laughs> in uh, about uh, 20 meters, I'm sorry. So we could do, we could build a bridge of 60 meters in about a 20 meter build area. So that's what really what makes it nice and, and flexible is you've got a very, tight locations such as um, some of these mountainous terrain that we put our, our bridges in. You may not have a, a, a very large construction area, but we could still build these bridges and getting them across. Uh, you know, it's manufactured with our high strength steels from US and ISO certified mills. And again, it's all galvanized. So again, it's for the longevity. So once the bridge goes in, the maintenance is, is almost uh, uh, negligible. You know, you may have to inspect the bridge just to making sure that everything is still tight every couple of years, but the finish on the bridge, you're not worried about any type of, of, of corrosion uh, and you're not going to be dealing with an environment, you know, uh, with that type of stuff you would see with a traditional uh, steel girder painted bridge. And when full-scale testing has been done on many of our, our components, uh, you know, we, we have a, in, we have a lab uh, internally in, in our uh, UK facility that has tested a lot of the components. And we've used many universities here in, in the United States to also test our components to making sure that it's rugged, safe, and durable. So temporary bridges, this is something um, we use uh, a lot here in the United States and, and, and then also in Europe and other places of the globe, but we do do a lot of this in, in the United States where uh, they'll put a bridge in uh, say they're going to rehabilitate uh, a roadway uh, and they can't impact the traffic to the region for economic reasons and just uh, the, the traveling public. They'll also, we can also install one of our bridges next to it. And as you see in this photograph, we put them between two spans that are being reconstructed. So again, we can use what we call as a bypass. Uh, again, <clears throat> that allows the, the local economy to continue and it's not impacted. Uh, not only can we handle the regular vehicular or, or regular traffic that the roadway would see, we can also handle heavy construction equipment, which would increase site safety. So in many cases, uh, you know, a contractor can use our bridge to move uh, heavy articulated dump trucks or off-road dump trucks away from the traveling public to keep it safe. So they may put a temporary build a structure or a bridge next to the construction site to, to maintain the safety of the public by moving all the heavy construction away from them. Uh, again, because it's modular, it facilitates accelerated bridge construction rather easily. And it does, you know, again, some of you see some of these slides, they kind of will always say the, you know, very similar thing because it's, you know, modular, our length, weight, and strength 
uh, is very easily customizable. Again, commerce will continue to flow with the local economy to able to continue to thrive. Um, our bridges can carry, carry full highway loading. Uh, you know, in the United States, we call that HL93. That's our standard highway loading. Uh, many states have heavier permit loading. Uh, which we also have to carry in Europe. It's the LM1. And I know in, in India, it's the, uh, was the R70 loading uh, that we, we, we designed to. Again, it's fast, easy assembly and disassembly. What's nice is once the bridge is done, uh, we do rent a lot of these. So once the bridge is done, the bridge comes out and returns back to the yard to be reused again. That's one of the, the huge benefits when, when we're looking at a temporary application is once the bridge project or whatever project you're, you have this, this struck the bridge on is completed, the bridge can come out and then be restored and then be used on another job, maybe with a different configuration to handle that site. That's really one of the huge, you know, advantages uh, for this structure in these applications. And this is where, you know, some of the, 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 the increase in use of, of the panel bridge really started back, like you mentioned earlier, is, is emergency bridging. You know, because they're modular and a lot of the stuff is in stock in, in facilities, we can actually, um, you know, deliver anywhere in the world rather quickly. You know, it's we, we've done jobs where we shifted out in, in 24 hours uh, of being notified that there's an emergency. And, you know, several days later, uh, the bridge is, you know, the bridge is back into place and in service with the local economy uh, not impacted or the local population. Uh, you know, again, also too, is it, because it's modular, uh, we can expedite it really into challenging locations. Um, again, it's it's rapidly assembled, so in many cases, in an emergency situation, you might not be able to to get some of the the, the heavier MHE or material handling equipment or larger cranes to a site. We could still do things by hand with smaller equipment or even by hand, you know, with uh, physical labor if required. Um, you know, it's proven in humanitarian aid and disaster relief. You know, there's many cases where these bridges have been put into Africa and South America and Asia where natural disasters occurred or um, where we needed to get into or a, an agency, for example, the World the Food or the World Food Organization or was it World Food Bank? I'm sorry. They needed to get into an area. We could supply a bridge for them to get in there through the United Nations and uh, they could easily get the food, medical supplies to an area uh, if something really is dire in a short period of time. Uh, you know, Acro and maybe both, it's now, you know, Acro, we have expense, extensive experience working with governments, ministries, and aid agencies. You know, it's 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 very common for us to be right as a, as a partner with these agencies and, and getting these solutions there fast, timely to making sure that, you know, the global pop the population, the area um, gets what the, you know, what aid or uh, relief that they need. And every one of our, our bridges is always supplied with a te full comprehensive technical support. So that's from design, obviously manufacturing, right through installation. You know, we do have um, a, a cadre or a team of very experienced field technicians who on a short period of notice could be deployed worldwide uh, to help install these structures to making sure that everything is put together safely uh, correctly and um, as fast or as, as we can get it into the site. Uh, multi-span. So we did mention about multi-span. So you're not just limited to, to single span structures. We can also do multi-span. So over the last, uh, I'd say, 10 years or so, the market has evolved from the structure, these you know panel bridges being just used on single spans to now doing very large, long, multiple spans. Uh, we have a myriad of ways to do that. Um, we're going to show you some examples of that. Um, they are a little bit more engineering intensive, and they do require some additional direction from from the owner. You know, whether it be the you know roadway agencies or or a province or or um, you know even the national government may need to to give us some better direction as to what they're looking for. But again, we could easily um, you know we could easily do almost anything uh, that is uh, required. So we, we do have two different types. We do call them, um, I'm gonna use some American nomenclature. I think the you know nomenclature is used a little bit differently globally. Uh, we, we got one option where we could do what we call a continuous span. So we treat our structure as one big long beam with multiple supports along it. And what we do is we put this uh, rather simple uh, little uh, bearing beam that we call a distribution beam underneath it. Uh, and then we support the bridge on that. 
So what's nice is um, it makes it fast, easy. There's no lot of modification once the bridge is in. There's no multiple bearings that have to be set. We're always using, you know, again, it, everything goes back to one bearing point. We're not having to jack our bridge up, pull a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of material out, putting a lot of material in and then putting it on a two separate bearings. We, this is what's nice is we just treat it as one big long structure and it, we use one simple little bearing to support it. The other one we call is a broken span. I believe uh, the one term I know that the English use is called top pin out. So really what this is, is this treats the bridge as a bunch of, or a series of simple span bridges. So uh, we use this in many cases where you've got um, spans of very differing length. So you may have one span that's 60 meters and it may be next to a span of say 30 meters. We would not be able to do that as a continuous span because what would happen is you'd get uplift on one of the uh, on one the one on the short span uh, with a continuous structure. So then what we do is we will remove a pin and then the whole bridge gets treated as a series of uh, basically simple span bridges. But yet it is still physically connected to one another uh, with the bottom pins. And I'll show you a detail of that. So you know here's uh, let me just get the uh, let me go in here. If you see my mouse a little bit here, you'll see that normally in a situation like this, we have a special bearing that sits on the bottom. And then what we do is we actually pull the pin out at the top. And then now the, the bridge will act as a series of simple span structures. Uh, and again, we, we use this in, in many, many multi-span uh, multi applications globally where you have uh, spans of, of significant difference in lengths. All right, we're going to go into something. Uh, we're going to go into some system details here, and it's going to be really some main components and installation methods. So this is where the system. You'll see some of the details of, of, of the individual components, and also too is it's it's neat to see we can install these bridges in several different different manners. And this is that's where one of the huge advantages of are using these bridges, especially in in rural and undeveloped areas. Pardon me. So the bridge really has three main components. There's an orthotropic steel deck, there's a transom or floor beam, and a truss panel. And that's really the main three components. There's nothing much more than that. And I mean, we do have some additional bracing that does get put in the bridge, but those are your main three components. And they are generally, um, as short of the transoms, the steel deck and truss panels are used on any bridge configuration that could be you know, put together. They're always the same. That's where we go back to the modularity. It's being used, so if you have a bridge that's uh, 4.2 meters wide or a bridge that is uh, 7.35 meters wide, it's the same components. The only thing that would be different would be the transom, but the deck and the truss panels are used uh, for both structures. So that's why we're talking about it. It's really nice is if you've got, um, say, an inventory where you put these for emergency bridges, you could purchase a series of, of truss panel, of basically panels and deck, and then you just have a couple of different size transoms you can easily reuse your material around your, your region, wherever you may be working rather quickly, uh, using always the same components. So it reduces your, your initial investment significantly by having that modularity and, and reusability. So orthotropic steel deck, uh, this is, it's, it's a simple deck. It is, uh, see here, it's roughly three meters long by 1.8 meters wide. Uh, you know, some we do, there's some additional filler sizes that we have available. So it's here. We, so it's orthotropic in design. Uh, the decks are available uh, in in several uh, versions. We have curb units, which has an integral curb as part of the deck. We have a standard unit, which actually has no curb. That would be used like on an interior uh, location. And due to some of the widths, we do have some what we call infill units that would make up uh, whatever roadway or carriageway width you have you have on on your project. Uh, we have a driving surface that's either coated with an epoxy aggregate overlay. Uh, that's what you see on here. That's already applied to the deck. It comes that way and it's delivered that way. Or if we know that the bridge needs to be having an asphalt or bituminous overlay to it, we can apply, supply the bridge as plain steel. And then you could uh, pay, if, you know, by using uh, tackifiers and, and, and paving fabrics, you can then pave uh, and put an asphaltic type uh, finish on the, the deck. Uh, the epoxy aggregate, the anti-slip that we apply is five millimeter thick. It's a, it's a coarse aggregate uh, that is epoxyed right to the deck in our factory. And um, again, as we talked about earlier, we could provide the plane for the asphalt. 
transoms. So that's transoms, or, we or many people may call them floor beams. We call them transoms. It's just a, a wide flange beam that the, that the roadway will sit on. Uh, they're all, all our steel is Ashto M223 grade 50. Uh, for, that's for the 700 XS bridge. Um, I don't remember the, the British standard uh, equivalent for the uh, compact 200 system. But again, it, it's, it meets the, the British standard steels. But uh, our steels are all grade 50 or S345. Uh, what's nice is this is where we talk about some of the modularity. Unlike the, the Bailey type systems, which the transom does not sit at the pin location or where the panels pin together, uh, you do sometimes have to get into some, you know, you, you have a right and the left side of a bridge because of this, it, even though the bridge itself is modular, the deck might not be modular, or you may have some extra cross bracing uh, that has different lengths just because of where the transom sit. You're also limited to the transom depth that could be uh, put on the bridge because of the, uh, basically it's a diamond that it sits inside. Uh, unlike that, the 700 XS bridge, uh, it doesn't do that. We actually sit at the panel pin, so we're not limited to the height of the transom, which allows us to make wider uh, carriageway widths. So that is one of the huge benefits about this system is in the older Baileys, you're limited to what you could do. And that's why you'll see only a lot of single lane or bridges maybe only up to about seven meters approximately wide where for our bridges, you can see bridges up to 10, almost 11 meters wide uh, because you've got that flexibility where everything's located at a pin. It's not gonna hit any internal members of the, of the panel. So again, that's what's really a huge, huge change. And this was made about the, what, 25, 30 years ago in this system. That was one of the big advances where it became more modular in that fashion. Uh, the standard roadway widths, as you can see, they vary from 3.65 all the way up to 10.97. So again, those are standard widths that are off the shelf. You can order it that way and we, we could ship it. Um, if a bridge is going permanently in and it requires a specific width, we can do that for you. Again, we could, we could fabricate or manufacture a specific width that's required for your project. Uh, our transoms could be used in a bunch of different types of configurations. We have the orthotropic deck that we showed, but we can also use timber and steel and, and timber decks on our structures as well. So it gives you flexibility in some of the rural areas or areas where you may be doing like mining or heavy type construction areas or um, extractive minerals where uh, the decks don't hold up. The decks can hold up, but the sometimes a timber deck is a little bit better of a, uh, of a solution just for longevity and ease of maybe uh, uh, replacement because it does see some more wear that you would see on a, on a highway structure. And then most transoms except the guardrail are a guardrail uh, post and tube system. So here, I'll show you a picture of what the integral guardrail is, but almost all of our transoms have the ability to put a, a, a purpose-built guardrail system onto it. And the last but not least, the truss panel. Okay, so again, uh, our truss, this is where we get into the higher strength steel. So our truss panels are constructed from grade 65 or S450 steels. So this is where you're getting to where originally they were using the, the you know, again, the, the, the lower grade steels uh, when Donald, Sir Donald Bailey originally designed it, that's what was available in the market. But because steels, uh, higher strength steels are now much more common and easily to, to purchase and very efficient and cost effective, we've upgraded the steels to the S450. So you've got very, very high strength steels now in, in, in the original design which is, again, you get that night, you get that benefit of the cost uh, for the span, the, the basically capacity ratios, definitely with that. Uh, standard panels are always 3.05 uh, pin to pin. That goes back to Donald Bailey's, Sir Donald Bailey's original design of 10, of 10 feet. And the panels, like I said earlier, are 2.3 meters tall, uh, where the original ones are only about 1.5 meters tall. So just by adding a little bit more, uh, you know, really think about it, not really much more in depth, we've significantly allowed us to get to longer spans and carry higher loads. Uh, these systems also come with a high shear panel capacity at the ends where we can uh, take higher shears. Because we can now push the bridge sides out longer, we can carry very heavy loads. We've got some, uh, we got uh, three different types of what we call shear panels that will allow us to be in, in, put into the bridge. They, they're built to the same dimensions as a standard panel. So you would never know. The only thing is you would you could see internally that they're slightly different. But what's nice is it's fully integrated or integral with the system. So 
there is no difference between, you know, again, even though it's a, it's a special panel, it's still uh, modular in the fact that it pins up to any other panel that's, that's, that's part of the system. Uh, we talked about the modularity. So as you can see, this is just a, a good picture that shows you the ability to why the system is so modular. So we can go into, um, you know, this can go into uh, what we call uh, uh, the nomenclature we use is like SS and DS. That's got to do with the trust lines. And, and that's for the, the first letter. And the second letter is uh, what we call um, the height. So we could not only have uh, single story trusses. That's what the, the second letter is. We can also do double story trusses. And as you can see here, we can go everything from an SS right on through what we call a QD. Um, so that's what's nice is we can actually go up to four trust panel lines on each side. So that's why the system, we can carry so much more higher loads because the ability to carry, you know, the modularity to basically construct a bridge, always utilizing the same components to carry such much, much, much heavier loads. Uh, there's a couple other ancillary parts that we use, you know, on most projects and just to make everybody aware. We have what we call a reinforcing cord. And what this is, is this is bolted uh, right to the top of the, the truss panels. And this allows us to really increase our, our flexual or bending capacity and stiffness of the bridge. So if we have to go longer, uh, we can actually add this reinforcing cord to the top and it allows us to basically carry more load or reduce deflection criteria for that span. Uh, they are available in, again, in the 3.505 and the 6.9 cord lengths. So what's nice is uh, they're built into the same modules that you would build the bridge in. And we do have three types available. We have a standard, heavy, and super heavy. And that's just got to do with the depth of the cord. So we do have three different depths, which allows us to gain um, you know, it, it allows us to gain significant increase with adding very uh, little extra material to the bridge. And that's really one of the, the great nice features about, about the, using these components and using the panel bridge. Uh, we have the ability to put foot walks on a bridge. Uh, you know, in many, many cases, and we see this a lot with permanent bridges, you know, there's, we want the pedestrians to be away from the traffic. Uh, so you'll see that these foot walks are actually cantilevered off the side of our bridge. So that way the truss um, acts as a barrier between the, the walking public and, and the driving public. So uh, the standard size is 1.5 meters, but they're also available in one meter and 2.6 that are available. Uh, they are designed to ash tow codes, both ASD and a LRFD. And we can also uh, design, or they're also, they also meet the IRC code uh, there for you in India. Uh, our decks uh, use the same epoxy aggregate coat that is available on the roadway deck. And it does have an integral guardrail system, which you can see from the photograph, uh, hand, or I should say handrail system uh, for the safety of the public. Uh, this is a, a, our guardrail system. Again, almost all our transoms have the ability to put a, a guardrail system. So we do have different types that can be done. And the photograph of what you're seeing here is what we call a uh, post and rail system. So that's where we actually have uh, structural steel tubes that acts as the the guide rail for the bridge, but we can also put Armco type or what we call W or Thrive Beam as well to the same posts. Um, these are uh, designed to ash tow crash testing loads and we call them TL, uh, they're called the TL loads. Uh, and we are, um, they are designed with the crash test forces that's set standard uh, for ash tow. And they're very, very similar to the uh, Euro code. Uh, you know, they're, they're almost identical to the Euro code. And I know like in Canada, the, they use the American crash test loading uh, cases as well. So uh, they're pretty high loads for the most part. And again, uh, we've had experience where vehicles have hit these posts um, while they're traveling and there's, it protects the truss. And when the vehicles do hit it, it's, there's no discernible movement at all in the post and the rail and it keeps it away from the truss. So it does not damage our trusses, which is great because that's, that's what we want to do in, in this situation. So these are very, very uh, safe and robust systems that we can add to, to any structure. Uh, there's, we're gonna go to some installation methods. So we talked about the advantages of the panel bridge where we can actually install the bridge rapidly. And there's a bunch of different ways that a, that a contractor or an agency can actually install these bridges. Um, the tools that are required are basic hand tools. There's nothing really, um, really, really required. The panel itself goes together with pins so um, that's really your structural component. There's no bolts. Every, the, the main structural component is a pin. 
We do have bolts that do go into the bridge, but the bolts are mainly secondary bracing bolts. They're fit up bolts or really just connection bolts. Uh, we do have one bolt that is a what we do call a structural bolt. That's the one that would attach the, the panels together in a double story configuration or um, uh, the reinforcing cords. That one there is more of a shear connection. So we really don't have any friction type connection. Uh, the bolts are not preloaded. They're just simple, you know, what we call, uh, you know, ASC turn of the nut uh, or just really hand tight for the most part. There's nothing that's really required or any special tools. So again, that's what's nice about the system is simple hand tools are just used to really build, construct, and install the bridge. So just a couple of different methods you could do it. One option is you we could build it in place. We do do this often. It's built on temporary dunnage or shoring. It doesn't require a build area. So when we build a structure, uh, or sorry, when we build a bridge, often there has to be a build area either next to it, depending on the method, or behind the what we call the home abutment or the abutment the abut we're going to launch from. Normally, there's going to be a build area of some length that's re really required. Uh, but in some tight locations or regions, maybe that not be available. But we can actually build it on temporary shoring or dunnage. Um, so again, it's it's again because of its flexibility, the bridge allows us to do this. And again, um, you know, the contractor or the local region or whoever's doing the work, they'll have to design some sort of temporary dunnage to support the bridge. ICRA will provide guidance and give them where everything would need to be supported. Of course, all the weights and design loads, that's what we'll do. But again, that, that will be done more on the local level uh, to supply that shoring or dunnage. And then you can only build somewhere between 9 to 12 meters a day. So you can pretty rapidly, as you can see, we can rapidly build a bridge in, in, in a rather quick period of time. Another common method is, and we use just this on generally shorter bridges, um, you know, say bridges up to about um, 40 meters, even though you can do bigger, uh, but you will see this on bridges maybe up to about 40 meters, where we'll build the bridge next to the site and actually lift it in with a large lattice or hydraulic uh, boom crane, where um, what's nice is, you don't have to worry about any type of roller system. You just build everything on the ground. It's work uh, for worker safety. Everything's kind of at ground level. So you don't have a lot of people climbing uh, on things or you're over um, at height. You're not working mm -hmm. at height. What's nice is you're actually, um, you know, building everything from the ground. Um, it does require a build area that's pretty close to the final position because you don't really want to walk the bridge, uh, which you can do if it's required, but you want to build it pretty close to the site. Um, one of the big challenges may be is sizing a crane. You know, these bridges can become heavy, even though they are relatively lightweight. Um, if you're building a double story bridge that's three lanes wide, it does get rather heavy for a, a crane to be able to pick up. So again, you do have to size an appropriate crane to lift it. Um, we can pick it up with one crane or two cranes. So, I mean, that gives you some flexibility on, on crane selection size. Um, and then once you build the bridge, normally you can lift it in in about 30 minutes. And you can have the road open to traffic probably within two to three hours after that, once you put the deck on and maybe finish off some of the approaches. Uh, normally in a situation like this, you could probably build anywhere from about 12 to about uh, 20 meters a day, depending on the truss configuration. So that's how, how fast you can actually build one of these structures and bridges, I should say. Uh, one of our other common method, and this is, we use this a lot um, here in the United States, but we do also use it globally, is where we do what we call a crane assist. So this is where we actually would build a bridge and we actually push the bridge out to a point, um, like a giant, you know, if you want to think about it, like a giant seesaw or teeter-totter. We get to the point where the center of gravity is still safely behind the roller system. And then we hook a crane up to the front, and then we will push the bridge across using the crane to support the tip of the nose to simply push the crane across and lower it down onto the abutment. This is a fast, easy way to install the bridge. Um, again, we could build this from a speed aspect. You can actually build the bridge in, a, again, about up to, you know, 12 to, to 20 meters a day, uh, depending on the truss configuration. Um, and we can get a bridge across pretty quickly. And again, the, 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 one, the one thing would be is the contractor or the agency would need to size a crane and provide all the rigging. Uh, to, to get and use this application. And normally it takes less than an hour to launch a bridge in this fashion. If the bridge is completely built and we're pushing the whole bridge across, we can have the bridge on the bearings in about an hour. So as you can see, that's one of the huge advantages of getting some of these bridges in, in, in very, very locations around the world. 
This is probably what a lot of people maybe think about with a Bailey bridge is where you have what we call a cantilever launch where you basically build a, a nose on the front of the bridge that allows a lighter, a lighter bridge to be built or a lighter structure in front of the bridge to launch ourselves across the gap. This is very, very common. We use this a lot in rural areas. We do this for uh, sometimes our, our longer, heavier bridges. We will use this method because it's the easiest. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's very easy. Uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is this requires a, a, a decent sized build area behind the abutment, which we're going to launch the bridge. So that's something that needs to be considered. So the one thing you can use as a, a rough guide is the build area would need to be roughly the same, same span. The build area length would have to be about the same as, as the longest span you have for a bridge. So if your bridge was um, 20, say 50 meters, your build area would need be approximately 50 meters. You probably could do, do it a little less, but that just gives you a good rule of thumb of what you would actually need to, to, um, to consider uh, if you're going to use this type of method. Uh, what's nice is the launching nose uses the same components as the bridge. So there's nothing special. Again, it goes back to the modularity. So the nose is constructed from all the same parts as you construct the bridge from. So again, it, it, it's, it's, that's where we talk about reducing uh, your initial investment cost. It's using the same parts. So what's nice is if you have a storage of this material, the bridge could be used either, the, this material could either be used for the nose or the bridge itself. That's what's great about, about this type, with, about the, the, the panel bridge system. Um, what you'll also see is if we have a longer bridge, we may build the bridge in shorter pieces and push it out. So if you have a short build area with say a longer gap or a longer span, we'll build uh, say 100 meters, push it out, say you know uh, 50 meters and we'll do it again and we'll do it again until we get across the gap. Uh, what you'll also notice is because that we do that the tip, the bridge will actually deflect down, the tip will deflect. To do account for that, you'll see in the photograph that we actually kick the bridge up to account for that dead load deflection. So that's one of the, the services that, that, that we provide as part of the package is we calculate all that and we design the nose and everything for your site. So that's, that's what's one of the key support aspects of, of ACRO uh, on these types of projects for, for you. All right, so we're going to go into bridge design. It's, this is a rather short section. We're going to talk a little bit about codes and specifications and what we could do uh, really globally uh, to support any project. So our design methodology. So panel bridges, we could design to any code, any specification that an owner, agency, government entity may require. So for example, you know, if we have to design to the AASHTO codes, we'll design to AASHTO. You know, in India, we'll design to the IRC code. If it's in Europe, we design to whatever country it is with their annex. Uh, so again, we, we're, very, we're very knowledgeable in all these codes. Uh, if not, we just, we just learn them pretty quick. <laughs> but what's nice is we can design the bridge to the code. So it's not only the design loads and the design vehicles, but it's also the capacities. So we'll go in and calculate our capacity for the bridge based on your local code. And we have capacity tables already developed for most of the globally accepted codes. So, so the AASHTO codes, the British standard code, the Euro code, we have them for the India code. I think we've got the Australian code. Again, we've got already uh, capacity tables for our systems all developed for many of the local or um, you know, the globally accepted codes out there and including some regional codes. But again, one thing I wanna make, uh, you know, make it a, a point here is regardless of whether it's a temporary or permanent bridge, our designs are always treated as if they were a permanent structure. So when we design a bridge, we're following the code as if you would design a permanent bridge. Uh, you know, maybe in certain applications on the temp, we may, um, if the code allows, we may do some reductions or we do have a lot of experience on like say off-road, you know, we call extractive type businesses like mining or off-road construction. We may um, make some suggestions or, it's not, it's not taking a shortcut or, or, sim, or, or short the design. We just apply uh, proper engineering uh, knowledge and experience to give you a efficient system for what that application is. But whenever we're dealing with the, with the public, uh, it's always, you know, whether it's a permanent emergency or temporary bridge, we're designing per the code as if it was a permanent bridge. So that's one thing I wanna make very, very important is we don't treat these as, as temporary structures, no matter what we're doing with it, it's always treated as a permanent structure. So for design vehicles, we can design for any road legal or heavy construction vehicle that's available across the globe. 
Like I said earlier, we can design up to about 240 metric ton vehicles without a problem. As you can see in the photograph, we can design for regular road legal trucks right on through to heavy construction equipment. Uh, whatever is available, we can design to. Um, you know, we do see some of the bigger, bigger vehicles, which may be a bit of a challenge to put on a bridge, but we do have other options which we could approach to, to handle those, those vehicular loads. Um, so temporary versus permanent. So let's just briefly dis discuss this. So, you know, globally, um, our panel bridges are used in more permanent applications than temporary applications. Again, the reason why it's done is for safety, robustness, modularity, and the ease of installation. So again, that's why you'll see our panel bridges or panel bridges in general used as permanent bridges. And again, a lot of our, our supply and our projects, they are permanent bridge applications. So again, we do get in, you know, you do hear a lot of people who don't understand a panel bridging say, oh, they're used for temporary or, or emergency. No, they're really not. In reality, they're used more often for, for permanent applications. And that's really where, you know, there, there's that misconception about the, the panel bridge. Um, but it's also important that the designer has realistic expectations and specifications on how you want that bridge to perform, because we take that and that's what we're going to design a bridge to. So for example, some of the considerations you want to have is what design life do you want? Uh, you know, our panel bridge is designed from anywhere from 75 to 100 years. You know, again, we, if you got something uh, maybe a little less than that, we may uh, slightly modify the design uh, to make it again, more cost effective or efficient. Uh, for for that 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 particular requirement, again, design vehicle. What's your current design vehicle? But also, what is your future design vehicle? You know, we talked to earlier about the Bailey Bridge was designed for a forty ton truck or tank. Well, we do a lot of military bridging still uh, with the U.S. Army, uh, the Canadian Army, and many other armies around the globe. Well, the vehicle loads went from forty tons, and we're now designed to one hundred and fifty ton vehicles. So again, is they have to design, you know, the bridges that maybe the military or some of these organizations bought, you know, 30 years ago, they didn't anticipate some of the heavier loads. So, but if you know what it may be, you know, we could put that in right now and then you'll have a bridge that'll last much, much longer. You don't have to worry about rehabilitation or replacement, you know, 50 years down the road. You still have plenty of capacity in that bridge 75 years from now. Uh, one key thing is what's your daily truck, we call average daily truck traffic, or how much volume are you really seeing with trucks on that road? Because that's going to affect on how we look at the deck and the transom and some other components. And that does tie right directly into your fatigue requirements. Um, you know, if we know what your, your truck traffic is going to be on that, we'll take that in consideration and design your bridge for that fatigue requirement. You know, are you going to have pedestrian utility roads? Maybe when a bridge is originally designed, you're not thinking about that. But I know we're doing... You know, we, we look at, you know, we do jobs in, in the Malaysian and in Southeast Asia where they do, hey, listen, we may put a utility on the bridge or we may put pedestrian. So please design our bridge with that now in mind. We're not going to put it on now, but please design that, have that designed in mind. So we'll look at that. You know, what's your overlay type? Is it going to be the epoxy finish or you want the asphalt type finish? You know, deflection requirements. This is, this is a, a normally like in the American code, or US code, it the flexion requirement is set by the owner. So if you want to, if you want a robust stiff bridge, specify it. You know, we generally design our bridges to, uh, you know, our deflection ratio of L over to 800 or better. So that's really what we our target is L over 100. If we're doing pedestrians on the bridge, we'll bump that up to about L over a thousand. Uh, but in some spaces, cases, if you've got a temporary bridge for maybe you know six to ten months, so you're going to use it as like one of those bypass bridges. You can have a little bit lower, uh, you know, deflection requirement where you may look at L over 600, L over 500. We try not to go below L over below L over 600 because that bridge just becomes way too bouncy. Uh, you know, the term we use is a banana bridge when we start getting into those types of deflections. So again, you know, if you want a, a, a longer term permanent type of application, specify your deflection requirements. And of course, make clear to us, you know, what the environmental loads are, you know. We do have cases where, you know, you do get flooding and we have to take that in consideration is, you know, are the flood loads going to cause, you know, any type of structural compromisation uh, if it hits the bridge with debris or what the case may be. So we would need to know that up front. You know, a good example of also environmental loads is snow. Um, you know, is there snow and ice that we have to deal with? Because that 
be ironically, it adds more weight than most people think is something we have to look at. So again, knowing what those are and it's in the specification allows us as a designer to really meet your criteria and meet the, the, the realistic expectations that you're looking for for the performance of, of, of this bridge. So fatigue, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say, or again, this is one of the, the misconceptions of a, of a panel bridge is, oh, they can't handle the fatigue. Well, they're wrong. We can't handle the fatigue. Um, and also too, is due to the nature of the panel bridge and our manufacturing quality, we can meet any fatigue requirement that's either set by you as the owner or by the code. We regularly design for bridges of 2 million years, 2 million cycles or more and 75 years of surface. As long as we know what the fatigue requirements are per your design or your code, we could design to that. Um, again, our panels are very robust, they're very safe. And I'm gonna go into the next topic here, which is what we call um, really redundancy. What's nice is if something did break, we got multiple panel lines, which then, um, you know, if something ever did break, we got that redundancy in the system that it could easily be gone back out either replaced or repaired and put the bridge back in service just like it was before. So that's what we call fracture critical. So in the United States, we have a, a term that we use called fracture critical. Uh, this is a requirement through our federal highway system. And really what that means is if a main structural member fails, um, you know, the bridge basically will collapse under load. So what's nice about a panel bridge system is because we have multiple, multiple truss lines, there's multiple load paths, thereby we no longer are considered what we call fracture critical. So in many of these rural applications where, you know, you do see sometimes rock falls and you see, um, you know, uh, maybe poor driving and, you know, the bridge does get hit due to uh, impact from a vehicle. If it damages one truss, you have maybe th two other trusses behind it, the load just gets simply transferred over to the one behind it um, and the bridge does not fail where if you did something like a tip boat, like a standard girder type bridge, or maybe a box, uh, you know, not so much a box girder bridge, but like a concrete uh, girder bridge, if something ever compromised, you know, the, the tension steel, or if it was a, a post-tension or pre-tension where it, you know, snapped one of the tendons, the whole bridge is gonna come down. You don't get that with a panel bridge. We, uh, because of the redundant members, we are no longer, we can solve, in the US, we don't call it fracture critical, but again, it's again, What's nice is the bridge will not fail if something ever did happen. There is one exception is if you did have a single truss line, that would, you know, one panel did break, you could potentially, you know, have the bridge fail. But we generally do not design single lane structure or single truss structures uh, for one, we don't really don't do them for permanent applications. But two, in most cases, the spans and loads no longer allow us to use single truss lines unless it's a very, very short span rural location with like two or three trucks every month or something along those lines. So again, because we're designing everything with multiple truss lines, we never have an issue. So manufacturing and quality control. So we're gonna go into a little bit about on how we, how we you know, basically give you a high quality product with uh, high Q, QA, QC requirements. So manufacturer rather than fabrication. So unlike, you know, traditional steel bridge construction for plate girders or, um, you know, wide flange designs, or if you're doing, um, you know, precast girders or those cases, you know, we are actually manufacturing, not fabricating. So you don't get into a lot of those cases where you have to worry about misdrilled holes or field, maybe field modifications because something wasn't made right at the factory because of quality control, you know, the QC, Q, QA, QC process at that facility. Because we're manufacturing, we can use automation. So we actually, in our, in our factories, we're fully automated. So all the panels are made consistently the same over and over and over again in a robot. And they're made with jigs. So again, you've got very high quality with little or no defects that you ever see in the field um, that need to be addressed during the build. Everything has been checked at the factory. It's checked in our, our facility before it gets shipped out. So again, we have very high quality with little or no defects. So that's one of the big, the big, uh, you know, advantages of the system is it comes ready to be on site and installed and it gets installed without any problems. Okay, so our manufacturing facility. So this is the, the our US facility. I didn't, hold on. Um, I don't have anything here for our, our, our Lydney operation, which is the maybe bridge, but 
Our, our manufacturing facility for the 700 XS is in, in Milton, Pennsylvania. Uh, we about, our factory is four buildings at 13,000 square meters. Uh, and we could do about two, it was 20,000 metric tons annually. And I know we've done more than that, uh, but again, that's that's just a you know a rough idea of what we can actually produce out of this facility. Um, we have six robot cells and 13 robots. We have automated machines. We use FICEP for all our profiling and drilling of our transom or floor beams. We have uh, CNC plasma cutting and drilling tables. So again, it's a fully automated facility. Uh, we also have major certifications that are recognized globally. We're an AISC major steel fabricator, bridge major fabricator, which is a that's a, that's a big big certification that we um, you know hold, we hold near and dear. Is that allows us to do all you know that allows us to build bridges on the most complex projects in the United States by having that that um, that certification. We're ISO 9001. We have CE of Europe, and all our welders are AWS or American Welding. Society certified welders. So again, we've got very high certifications, which leads to that high quality. So quality control. So there's a bunch of different ways we have quality control. So um, I kind of broke them out into three main main buckets or, or, or items here. So in our factory in our yard, so we have time tested time tested technology that we exceed most quality standards. So while even though we, you know, we have to meet the, the minimum standards that set in those certifications, we exceed those uh, when we manufacture our bridge. And you can tell that because when a bridge comes to the site, everything fits nice and easy and you don't have to fight with pins or you don't have to fight with bolts. Everything fits up exactly how it was designed and easily gets installed and, and constructed. We have QA, QC processes throughout the entire manufacturing that mitigates product defects from ever reaching the field. Uh, we also reinspect all our material for quality assurance before we load it into our containers for shipment. So um, our facility is in Pennsylvania, but where uh, we ship everything out of it is a yard in, in northern New Jersey, about uh, 30 miles, it was about the 60 miles or so west of New York City, northwest. And everything is actually inspected prior to loading out into containers, again, by our, our, our yard people and our yard managers. Uh, and then... If uh, you know it's required, we can provide third-party inspections and certificates for all our equipment uh, and bridge components before they go out and are delivered to your site. So engineering services. We provide full engineering design services. So we design the, all the components, we design the bridge, we provide full calculation packages, we provide the full drawing package, installation, and if you have to take the bridge out, we'll also do the removal procedures for you. They're all, they're all provided. Um, all our bridge, all our uh, all our project managers or our senior engineers were all licensed in the United States. So most of us have one or or multiple licenses in the United States for for various states. Um, we do have staff engineers, but again, normally it's a licensed engineer who's responsible for the overall design. Uh, like I said earlier, along with superstructure drawings, we'll do the full installation and uh, removal packages if that's really required. And then if it is required, our engineering packages are, and this is happens, this actually work, occurs a lot with our, our market in the United States. We use a, we use a third party engineering firm that actually certifies our design documents. So while we do the design, we use a third party engineering firm to peer review us to making sure that we meet the codes properly. So that can be also uh, required, you know, that can be asked as a requirement and we can provide that as well. Uh, the other thing we have is we have our on-site technicians. So this is where, you know, uh, one of our, this is one of our shining stars on our, our organization is we have, uh, was it, uh, we got about approximately 20 field technicians uh, that we could easily send in, out to your job. And he will be there from the time you start uh, unloading containers through really opening the bridge to traffic. We are there the whole step of the way. We're there to support you. And we are there to making sure that the bridge is uh, assembled and installed properly. Uh, all our FSR, we call them FSRs, or field service representatives. They all have 20 plus years of experience working mostly in the U.S. Army or the British uh, Royal Engineers, uh, where they've built um, uh, their bridges in, in the military for the 20 years and then uh, for commercially after that. So again, these these are our team of FSRs are highly experienced. So they they've put bridges in in some of the the hardest and toughest locations around the globe, uh, you know, both with the with their service time in the military and with some of <laughs> some of our projects. So some of our guys have been 
in the deserts to Arctic conditions installing our structures and bridges. Um, and like I said earlier, the FSR will be present at the time of really building uh, and we'll, we'll stay on site until that bridge is basically open and we can certify that. So again, that's one of our, our shining stars. Actually, if you think about it, this whole slide kind of shows you the, the three main uh, huge advantages of what you get when you actually, uh, and the support you get when you, you uh, specify and purchase uh, these types of, you know, the panel bridge system. So uh, that's pretty much going to wrap up my presentation. So um, I guess we can open it up to the panel uh, for any questions in, in your open discussions. Uh, thank you, John. I think uh, Deputy General Ravi Shankarji, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for a very detailed uh, presentation. And one can uh, make out your passion for engineering with the details that you have covered. Thank you. Uh, today. Uh, you told us how all your bridges are always permanent, uh, how you manufacture and don't fabricate and the difference between that because that ensures better quality on the ground. And, uh, and so many other things to say how you can use this bridge quickly. Uh, I think now uh, I will first request uh, Dr. Mahesh Tandon to comment or ask for any clarifications he wants before we uh, go on to the others. Okay, uh, thank you. General, uh, we've had an excellent presentation from Mr. John Brain on the, I would say the advanced uh, uh, rapid uh, bridge construction. I think the main ideas that have come out is that you can have something which is factory made, which means it's pre-engineered, it's modular, and of course, it is quality certified. Uh, in the old days, it was the army which used this almost solely. And it was called the Bailey Bridge. And it was the army bridge. That's how uh, we used to look at it. And I can tell you the most interesting part, which made me almost join the army, was that in the uh, Indian Ma Military Academy, they have uh, a uh, out of all the three, four years, I don't know how many years they have, but they have in six months, they teach you how to construct bridges and the other six months, how to destroy bridges. That is the main attraction that uh, almost led me to the army because it is most interesting how you can destroy it and you can, how you can construct it. And of course, the army is always operating on a short time schedule. I mean, you have to construct bridges in an emergency kind of a situation. And even when the name uh, Bailey Bridge was slightly changed, we called it the Acro Bridge. But now, of course, Acro seems to have become a huge company and uh, congratulations. And uh, there are many new things that I have learned from the old days, whatever we understood from the old Bailey Bridge. Uh, some of the things was that you've gone up to spans of 80 meters, which I don't think existed at the time that I visited the Indian Military Academy. And uh, you're using high strength uh, steels of uh, yield strengths of 450 and 350 uh, MPA, which again, one didn't have at that time. Uh, you, there, things are becoming galvanized, all these components. This again is something uh, amazing. Uh, the uh, developments that have taken place. Uh, I think the most interesting part, I think, is how to protect the bridge. Because, you know, it is a, it is a sort of a U-shaped bridge. 
where the longitudinal uh, member of the bridge is above the deck and you can easily have the the traffic hitting it and th this i think is uh, quite quite an uh, issue and i would like to know what are the standards they use for uh, the impact of the vehicles to protect the bridge uh, the most another another interesting part is it's almost uh, like a woman's jewelry you can you you can erect it at one place and then you can dismantle it and erect it at another place so that's what the women do i mean they put on necklaces at a, for every different occasion they have this possibility of changing and i think this is what uh, uh, this uh, your acro thing uh, is uh, all about the other question that i have apart from the what uh, standards you use and the, for the impact is that for the son priyag bridge which you say is the first bridge in india made by this method what was the quality assurance and certification done any load testing done i mean how how was it uh, all how did it all come about because anything new you have to first establish that it is going to work not only on paper but in actual terms so these are the two questions that i have and of course the it's very ingenious to have you know where you can easily uh, have whatever width you want by just changing the transverse member which they call as transoms because really speaking that is what takes care of the whatever span that you want so that is another uh, interesting thing that one learned and how, how much was the width of the son bridge if we could have some details as to what was done to make it uh, uh, make a realization of that in india thank you i, I think john uh, you could first clarify about the guardrails and how you protect the structure you did cover it uh, yes maybe a little more yeah sure um so what the guardrail system does, it actually mounts to the top of the, the floor beam or transom, but it's offset away from the truss. So in other words, our, our, our transom uh, is wider. So you've got your carriageway width in, in the middle of the bridge. So say you got a 7.35 meter, call a carriageway. What we do is we, we increase the, 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 the length of the transom between the, the truss panels to allow a vertical post that gets mounted to the to the top of the transom and yeah. that post is far enough away that if it does get get struck or hit by a vehicle it doesn't deflect back into the truss it stays it stays basically stays vertical you, you may see some bending in in there's a it's a it's a strutted member it's a strutted member so you may see uh, some some damage or some some uh you know some bending in in the individual members but what does that does is when a vehicle hits that post or the rail and then it hits the post, it will not deflect back into the truss. It stays somewhat, ver it'll stay vertical. I mean, you may see a little bit uh, go back, but it stays away. But also too, is if it's in between our truss panels. So if it ever did go back, the members itself actually slide back in, in between the truss panel verticals. So it never, never ever comes into contact with anything. Uh, the other thing too is what we have is, again, we, we haven't necessarily, uh, we call crash tested or these, these, um, the guardrail system, but we have had them struck on high. You know, we've had them struck on our bridges before. And what we do, and we have observed, is when the vehicle does hit it, the load goes out over several of the posts. So it's not just one post taking all the load; it's three or four of them that take the load. So what's nice is it just starts the load starts to basically distribute itself out, and it just um, you know it prevents it from from moving back any further. So again, everything is is never comes even if something got hit full in full uh, with a full load. It never ever comes in contact with any of the panel members behind it, so that's why why we do it that way. I'll just add something. A number that I remember, John, is um, the TL four code under Ashto calls for fifty four thousand pounds or about two hundred forty two hundred forty kilonewtons of load being applied, really as a point load. 
uh, to the rail system. And that might yeah. answer some of the question. Yeah. Just to uh, add a little, what he explained was that the posts are on the transom and even if the posts are pushed, yeah. they go between the panels. Mm -hmm. then between the posts, you have the normal guardrails, which are mm -hmm. to international specifications, TL4, as he explained. And mm -hmm. that relates to our codes also of guardrails on bridges. So these bridges come with built-in guardrails that have been very safely fitted on it and mm -hmm. uh, to the highest quality. Uh, uh, have I summed that up? Uh, okay. So that yeah. is one part. Uh, uh, Tell us something about Son Priyag. <laughs> so yeah, now, you asked oh, about Son Priyag. Now you're on Son Priyag. Okay. Now, as far as Son Priyag is concerned, uh, it was a first uh, uh, bridge. It was for a 60 meter span, able to take 70 hour double lane loading. We kept it to 5.5 meters, which is an intermediate lane, because that is what was required in those parts. Since traffic was going to a single destination, they said uh, a 5.5 meters double lane is enough. It could even have been 7.5 meters. Now, this bridge was carried all the way to Uttarakhand and uh, there unloaded on site. And uh, we had prepared the site to receive the bridge. The bridge came there, a supervisor came from Acro, and then the launching started. And uh, I think about uh, in, in three weeks, the bridge was launched. As far right. as the quality assurance and things like that are concerned, uh, the design was certified by ACRO and sent to us. Uh, the, before it was packed and dispatched, their experts had checked it. When it came, their logistic people helped us unload it and we checked it out and thereafter, we went on with the assembly and once it was assembled, their supervisor certified that yes, it has been assembled the way it should be assembled. And thereafter we did the load testing and let the traffic through. So the load testing is the requirement of the user, uh, making sure that it is assembled correctly, was done with the help of their supervisor since it was the first time. If you were launching more of these bridges, I'm sure we would be able to certify ourselves that it has been done correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the other thing is, as far as the government norms are concerned, uh, yes, there was an emergency in Uttarakhand. They wanted the Yatra to come through. And uh, at that time, they took World Bank sanctions to uh, get the bridge in. And to that extent, uh, it was done on a single tender, but with the permission of World Bank. And they compared the rates with other World Bank purchases with uh, sales in neighboring countries. They carried out an exercise to make sure that the price was reasonable. Uh, anything else you'd like to add on this in terms of the quality or? Yeah, but something I'm thinking about on the Sun Prayag Bridge, and John, you're better at this than me. Um, uh, yeah, we designed it for the R70, but remember that also had footwalks on each yep. side of it. We and I believe, the, uh, yeah, I believe the pilgrimage loaning actually was almost ex exceeding. Yeah, if, if my memory is accurate. No, you're right. Well, the pil pilgrimage loading requirement was was higher than the vehicle requirement <laughs> on that bridge, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because the footwalks were 1.5 meters on both sides. Both sides. I yep. forgot to mention yep. that. And it was designed for the 500 kgs per square meters, which was prescribed in the IRC. Uh, similarly, the main bridge was designed for a, a width of 5.5 meters, which was a standard intermediate lane, and for 70 hour loading, which meant single 70 hour or two lane of class A. It was designed for that. Yeah, or, or it was designed for the pedestrian loading yeah. obviously also. So yeah. it, there was the opportunity that it could be eight and a half meters of pedestrian loading or pilgrimage mm -hmm. loading. So I think that is also 500 kg per square meter. 
the pedestrian yeah. loading. Yes. Yep. It, it's on the bridge. I mean, I, if, as if the whole bridge may be, yep. uh, you know, full of pedestrians. I think that's the loading specified by uh, IRC. Yep, that's, that's exactly what we designed it to. We we looked at three load cases: the the seven ER. We looked at the the two Class A trucks, and then the full five hundred, you know, kilogram per meter squared on the whole bridge. Those were the three load cases that we used uh, to to ver- you know, basically validate the design we have. So, what is the design life? Uh, that would have been seventy five years, right, Bill? I think is yes. I don't really, yeah, yeah seventy five years. Yeah, because we keep the we keep the uh, fatigue stress range very low, uh, Professor, mm-hmm. and that really adds to that, that's the way we design the fatigue. We design it based on uh, the live load stress range, and you keep that down to a very low number, and your fatigue life increases accordingly. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, these bridges have been tried and tested in uh, very cold conditions, even in. Uh, in Alaska and Canada. So as far That's as fair. the uh, uh, winter conditions in the Himalayas are concerned, they're quite suitable. That was, uh, that was one assurance we had when we uh, recommended it for Uttarakhand. And yeah, we're, yeah. we're actually building one right now in BC and we're dealing with avalanches near the site and everything, but we have to get the bridge built because this is the only roadway through this portion of BC that uh, the road was uh, significantly damaged about a month ago. So yeah, and the temperatures there are about minus 20 uh, mm-hmm. with snow avalanches. And uh, I was l- talking to one of the gentlemen the other day and they received about a meter of snow on the job site. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually what we, we do, we've installed them what, also down in, was it Chile too, right, Bill? Like yeah. negative, what, negative 30? And I know oh, we got definitely, yeah, we got the ones up along the Arctic, the other end up in Canada too, up in uh, it was the Quebec province, right up there. Those are those mining bridges are all like negative thirty and negative forty up in that region. So yeah, uh, Baffin Island, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, where we have a whole yep. series of bridges on Baffin. That's Island. what I'm thinking you're about. Almost yeah. at the Arctic, yeah, you're almost at the Arctic Circle. There. Circle. Mm-hmm. General, would you like to see the uh, question and answers because some of them are quite interesting and. Uh, the people may like to interact. Sure. Uh, we, can, we can go through these and see. Uh, I think some of these questions have been raised even before the presentation, uh, before uh, John came to those, mm-hmm. and they have been answered in later parts of the presentation. Uh, so uh, let me just. Uh, there was one question which I just typed out an answer where somebody asked, Can we stock these for emergencies? In the country. So that was even before they started. So I said, yes, that's what we should do. We have been stocking Bailey bridges. We need to graduate to yes. better bridges. And this is one option. Uh, and that's what a lot of states do, Ravi, here and, and elsewhere, other countries. Uh, a great example from a state perspective is the state of Florida. Uh, some of you may be aware Florida gets tremendous rains, uh, very much like India can, and uh, very heavy storms, and they often lose bridges in Florida. So Florida actually keeps in stock. Um, I'm trying to put it in, in, in kilometers right now, but if I said to you they have about four or five kilometers of aqua bridging staged around the state just in case they lose a bridge. Uh, it's their way of uh, ensuring that they keep commerce and, and families flowing. There's one question, is this bridge suitable for 30, 32.5 ton, a cell load for railways? 
John, so, you can uh, grab it. You basically, want. you've shown only the uh, uh, road bridges. Uh, could you yes. uh, just yeah, explain we could, a little use for the railways? We could do railway bridges. Um, we've never really looked at the only code we've really looked at with railway bridges, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, is really the uh, ARIMA code, which is the, the ones that's used in North America. It's primarily, use, we, we've, it's primarily we have yeah. used the EU also. So. Yeah, okay. Um, it, we generally use what we call the, the Cooper rating of E80, um, which I think is what, I don't remember the actual weight of the, the, the locomotive that's for. Uh, well, it's, but, it's 40 tons an axle, and axle, each right? axle is one and a half meters. Yeah, so and, there you go. and it's a whole series of, of axles, so it, it's a very heavy loading. It's a heavy load. I mean, I just they said I don't know how to convert it over to <laughs> over to metric, you know. So anyway, so we can look at it. So I, what we would need to do is just take a look at what that is and then look at it. We are limited though with rail bridges. We are limited to span. So the, about the longest we've gone is uh, I think right now thirty seven. Yeah, about thirty seven. I was going to say thirty seven meters is about as long as we can go. So, um, again, because, you know, obviously rail loadings are, are heavy, but we can do it. It just we have to take a look at that and probably in a little more depth. So that's something that's um, you're looking at doing. Obviously, we could we could take a look at it for you and see what we can can do. But, you know, again, it's it's something that we can do. We have done. Um, but again, it's just we'll have to understand actually the probably the Indian code a little bit better when it came to uh, rail structures and rail bridges. Someone did ask a question about structural so, uh, How long is this Son Priyad bridge? Is it uh, just one span, single it's span, sp or is it multi span, or what is it? One span, 60 meters. 60 meters, yep. Uh, one span, okay. One span, 60 meters, yeah. And that, that's one what we call. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. But we didn't have the classic 60 meters behind the bridge to launch it. So launching it was a problem, and mm -hmm. there are other ways of launching it when you don't have enough backspace by putting a little counterweight, making a temporary structure in between, and things like that. So we did that, and that's how we managed to launch 60 meters in a very tight space. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying something, John? Uh, yeah. So that bridge is that was probably one of our that, that's got a what we call a quad configuration. So there's four. It's a quad double. So there's four truss lines on each side, and it's double story. And that goes back to Bill's comment about um, reducing the, you know, basically constructing the the constructing the the truss configuration for lower fatigue loads. That's a re, one of the reasons why we have a quad out there. So that's one of the that's one of the heaviest bridges we would actually put in is 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 this this bridge in San Prayag. It's it's a rather heavy heavy bridge. Um, but again, it's more for your fatigue and longevity. We want that to be there you know, 100 years from now, so. So one question is cost per square meter. What did it come to for Son Priyag? That's a good question. <laughs> I could, maybe I could do the math. <laughs> <laughs> you have a 60 meter span and I think the width is how much? Uh, five, five meters. 5.5 5. 5. 5 plus 1.5 on either side. So it comes to ah. 8.5 meters. Yes. <clears throat> 60 by 8.5 meters, I think it, it would come to about 1.1 uh, lakh per square meter or so, but uh, Bill will have- Is that what idea. it was? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to remember, Ravi. Okay. Uh, I'll definitely work that out and send it to you separately. A lot of people are asking about costs, but uh, the costs have a lot of factors to it. The, uh, the cost will depend on the span. It will depend upon the loading. It will depend on where the bridge is delivered. And uh, it will depend on the width of the bridge. Uh, even a square meter cost would be different for a 60 meter bridge, for a 45 meter bridge, for a 30 of meter course. bridge. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a very generic way of assessing. And when you give a square meter cost, the person has some site in mind and you have something else in mind. It doesn't really work out. So I have generally been avoiding trying to give a per meter square cost. I say, you tell me the site and I will let you know how much. But here is a typical case where we have a site, we have launched a bridge for a particular load. I'm sure we can work it out and let you know. Otherwise, okay. uh, there are a lot of questions on costs in this. But yeah. It's very difficult to uh, uh, specify our cost. 
and then they have their own problems. In the pandemic, transportation cost suddenly goes up. Oh yeah, that's so, true. So nobody, nobody is sticking to a, a a fixed cost. And even when they quote a cost, they say this applies for three months. But the yeah. difference would be just five percent, ten percent, left or right. Uh, it is think, it is fairly predictable. And it's very important, Ravi, that we when you look at cost, you look at the total life cycle cost of the bridge. Yeah. You know, when you put one of our bridges in, uh, the bridge will be there and it's going to be there for 75 years. Uh, you won't have to be thinking about, well, gosh, in 10 or 20 or 30 years, I've got to go in there and replace that bridge, which is part of your life cycle cost, or I've got to go in there and paint the bridge, or I've got to do something else to it. Uh, these bridges are truly designed to, to be a permanent structure. Um, and even our, even the deck system of, of the Akbar Bridge, we've had it at uh, University of Delaware, and we've tested it now to where it's holding up to ash tow loadings over 10 million cycles. So uh, you, you don't have to be concerned about the deck, which is the most fatigued part of any bridge, uh, wearing out on you, uh, which is all part of the life cycle cost. You did just to tie in it too, if a deck ever did get worn out, we have seen some decks get worn out on some jobs, but if a deck ever had to get worn out, all you gotta do is buy a replacement. You go out there, unbolt it with four bolts, you pick it up and you put the new one back in. You're not closing down the bridge for two, three months to replace the whole deck. It's you go out there, pull one deck unit off and put your new replacement in and you're done in, in 15 minutes. So again, is if you ever had to replace something, it's really, really fast. So I, I'll just add one more to this. Along with the cost, you have to see the value that the uh, person who gets the bridge gets. Uh, in Son Prayag, even if the bridge was three times the cost, it would still have been more valuable because the Yatra started, which opened a huge commerce avenue for the entire area. And it was a huge raise in morale for everybody that Kedarnath was open once again and the state was functioning. So in a situation like this, you have to match value with cost. Now, what happens in a city is if it takes you... Uh, there's an ROB, for example, which you want to change is the same. Uh, the accelerated bridge construction in the US came up because they had to change bridges and they wanted to find ways of changing them quickly. We have the same problem with the railways where the ROBs are 100 years old, 80 years old. They need to be changed. But where are we wanting them changed? We want them changed in the middle of Delhi. We want them changed in the middle of Bombay. We want to change without stopping Western railway traffic, Northern railway traffic, we want it without the uh, traffic on ground changing. So here, if it is a difference between closing traffic for three months and two years, you can see uh, the value that both the road agency and the railway agencies get for this. Now, the moment you compare this value with the cost, you may find it as marginally more expensive than a locally fabricated steel structure. But the value is so much more. So these uh, comparisons have been done at various places and shown to people, and a lot seem to agree that yes, there is a benefit of launching a bridge quickly, of course, with very high quality. That, that's a very good point, Ravi. What you just raised, uh, mm -hmm. John showed uh, photographs. I know I, I would be able to point it out exactly, but he showed a photograph where we put two two lane bridges side by side where a truss had fallen, and that was very near the city of Seattle. Uh, that goes back to 2013, that photograph. Uh, in that particular environment there with the local community, the city of Seattle and everything, if they kept Interstate 5 close, and that was Interstate 5, which is the main highway that connects San Diego to Canada, San Diego and Southern California to Canada in the north. If they kept that closed per month, they were saying it would add up to billions of US dollars lost in revenue in the area, both tax revenues and also commerce revenues. And we were able to supply a bridge for, on rental for about a half a million dollars that they installed in about two weeks. And we had Interstate 5 reopened. So, so that is part of life, life cycle cost also is, what does it cost the, uh, the local communities? Of course. One question here, can the bridge be launched with minimal presence of acro technicians on site? Uh, can we be trained to design the bridge for different site conditions and requirements? 
Uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, initially, when you use the bridge for the first time, second time, you definitely need somebody from Acro present to explain the whole thing. But once Acro trains a person, uh, the trained persons would be able to launch it themselves. That is how I think it is happening the world over. Uh, anything else John. you'd like to add to that, John? No, you're, you're correct. So normally what we would do is, um, you know, obviously our, our, our FSR will be there when we start, uh, try to do one or two first. But what we often do, and we do this with the, you know, with many, many countries is we'll train, you know, we'll have classroom training and hands-on training. You know, we may be there for three, four weeks with a, you know, with the con with whoever's doing the actual installation we'll work with with whoever it is set up a real classroom both hands-on and, and classroom training and get them trained up that way they can be self-sufficient um you know obviously uh with with any of our you know with uh, with the u.s army and you know, the canadian and the australians that we work with all the time they're fully trained and uh you know again we train them and then they go out and do them so again we you can do that it's not a problem the initial one we'd want to be there though uh, definitely to ensure that it's being done properly and installed safely. That's really where, what we'd want to be there from the initial. But yeah, you know, it's easy enough to train them, and and then you'd be on your own to to install them. So, do you have in mind any time in the future uh, where these uh, bridges would be manufactured in India? I'll I'll comment on that if you don't mind. Um, yeah. It's something that I've absolutely looked into on numerous occasions. And because of the, un candidly, the unpredictability of the market uh, of India and Bhutan and so on, um, you know, financially, it doesn't make sense just yet. But it is something that when, when we can realize that there truly is a market that would find uh, the bridges widely acceptable, uh, and that we would uh, have uh, adequate uh, uh, cash flow and revenue passing through. Certainly, we would uh, uh, look at manufacturing the bridges right there within uh, the boundaries of India. One question, an obvious, uh, uh, which I should have said when you asked of the Son Priyag Bridge, when was the Son Priyag Bridge constructed? March 2016. So it is about five to six years. Uh, I mean, having told you so much about the bridge, I think this was an important thing yeah. to add. Uh, someone has asked about the <laughs> orthotropic steel deck. He says, I know the rib deck joint is the major failure for orthotropic steel deck bridges, uh, will fail in fatigue. What are the measures taken in manufacturing this modular OSD deck? Uh, I think since Acro has worked so hard on their deck, uh, they could probably clarify this. John, do you want to or? Uh, if you like want one, to, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, it's well, one, I mean, one thing I'm thinking about. We over the years, we really have learned a lot about the deck systems. And uh, if I if I take you back only about five, six years, we we significantly modeled the deck systems first to uh, find what you might call those hot points in, in the structure, the, the deck structure itself, uh, where the welds might have been um, uh, having excessive stress within them at termination points, et cetera. So we, we, we actually learned significantly from that. We, we modeled it, we found what we believed would be the hot points. Then we went to University of Delaware and there we, we um, uh, really put many uh, measuring instruments onto the deck units uh, to uh, check the strains within the material. And we were able to uh, confirm or not confirm those hot points that we found in the modeling. But we actually adjusted our designs based on both modeling and testing, which lasted over about total of about two to three years uh, of, of this process. And we've now uh, determined physically through the, the test at University of Delaware that uh, these deck units un under the ashto fatigue loads are truly lasting for more than 10 million cycles. We, we actually terminated the test at 10 million cycles when it was showing no distress. So it's been, it, it, it actually, like there used to be a, a logic that you might say, add more welds to make something stronger. But what we found was by adding more welds, we were actually creating fatigue issues. So through all of this, modeling and testing, et cetera, we found out how to um, 
have the appropriate amount of weld that would be needed to connect the various members to each other and also how to terminate them better, uh, best so that we don't have uh, uh, high stress points throughout the structure that might be the, the origin or the genesis of cracks that uh, could turn into fatigue issues. Um, it, it, was a long, it was really a very long process, uh, but we've uh, been able to uh, 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 improve the deck so immensely that uh, they now hold up <clears throat> even to high urban loadings, such as uh, uh, it could be in Delhi or Bombay, but it, we use them here in New York City all the time. So I'll leave it there. And uh, uh, you've tested it for 100 million cycles or some such. Uh, 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 We've tested uh, the, it for 10 million, 10 million cycles. cycles. Yeah. They've actually tested it for 10 million cycles, which is. That, that's uh, correct, Robbie. Uh, which, as far as fatigue is concerned, is the figure in the uh, is the highest figure in our IRC codes, also. Yeah, you know, it, one of the goals of of Acro at the time was we wanted to ensure that we had a deck system. I know many people here are probably not familiar with what's called the New Jersey Turnpike, but we wanted uh, a deck system that we could comfortably put out there on the New Jersey Turnpike and know that we never have to look at it or think about it. And that's why we went through this process. Now, the New Jersey Turnpike is a 12 lane highway carrying literally millions of vehicles per day. So um, uh, we now have that deck system and that's what we wanted to achieve. And that's what we sell as our, our normal deck system. Now we do have uh, our normal deck system and then we have what we call the Euro deck system. And uh, the Euro deck system is also just designed for a heavier wheel loading of 200 kilonewtons. So, um, you know, it's, it's just, we, we tried to tailor the bridge a bit more for the European market, that's all. And the Euro, the Euro code is used so widely, especially through the African nations. Uh, may I ask a question, please? Hmm? Uh, I, uh, I, I wish to ask to John uh, and also uh, Lieutenant General Ravi Shankarji, for Son Prayag Bridge, do you have a a maintenance plan, uh, inspection and maintenance plan, which is, are you ensuring that, you know, the client Question. or the government is uh, really uh, maintaining or periodically inspecting the bridge? That's a good point. The maintenance good plan? point. Um, so I... <coughs> they insisted no, on a maintenance manual. We've given them the maintenance manual. Uh, and... Uh, the construction agency was the PWD. They did it as uh, in-house construction and it is for them to be inspecting thereafter. On my own, I've gone and had a look at the bridge. It's in fairly good construct uh, in condition, but I will not be able to vouch that they are following everything written in the maintenance manual. But as a manufacturer, I would like to know whether uh, Acro also, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, takes interest and sort of makes sure that the bridges where uh, they build, uh, the client is also maintaining. Is there any so, such plan? So we, we normally, so we, we normally, like, like Robbie said, we, we provide a maintenance plan. Um, we have a standard maintenance plan for all our, all our bridges. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty standard. The bridge is actually because there's very little bolts and connections, it's actually a very easy structure to, to inspect. Um, <coughs> we don't necessarily, once, once we sign off and certify the bridge, normally that responsibility gets turned over to the agency or whoever purchased the bridge. If it's required, uh, the agency can reach out to us and we're more than happy to come back out and, and take a look at it and do a periodic inspection. In fact, you know, in the United States, um, we, if we do have longer term bridges, we do often go out and perform the inspection on the bridge for the owner or agency or even a contractor if it's a long term, like a construction access or type bridge. Oh, you know, bypass bridge. Some states require a PE has to go out and do the inspection. We'll do it. It's it's normally as part of our our again our technical support, uh, but it can be done. Again, it, it's it's whatever the agency uh, that that owns the bridge what they really do require. But we won't necessarily go out and look at the bridge purposely. If we happen to be in the area on another job that'd be close, we may go up and see how it is functioning, uh, just to make sure that we don't see any issues. 
but again, we, we could, that's a service we can obviously provide um, easy enough to do. Yeah, just uh, just one more question on this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just extending that question. Uh, if, since you have provided orthotropic deck in case of uh, sole player, uh, how do you really uh, inspect the wells of the orthotropic deck from down below? I mean, is there any provision kept there, or how how do you really how one does an inspection if he wants to? That that's a good question. Uh, the only way you can actually inspect that is if you took the, the deck off. Unfortunately. Uh, you can see the bottom. It's hard to see the welds, though, uh, especially if because uh, there are some cover plates, so you're not able to see all the welds. Often, though, is where, where the fatiguing occurs is never on the bottom. It occurs often at the ends of the panel because the, the panel actually is a bearing connection. It, it's, there's a plate. There's an end plate that actually bears on top of the transom. That's where we'll see the fatigue or we'll see the fatigue. If you remember in the photo I showed, there were four tubes. Uh, that ran through the, the deck. That's where you see that those are the two locations where we'd see fatiguing. So the only way you, unfortunately, you'd have to take the, the deck off to, to, to observe that. Uh, what often is a telltale sign, though, that you start seeing fatiguing is if you've got high traffic loads, you will start to see the deck starting to um, start to deflect between the stringers. If you're starting to see that, then you may want to do an inspection where Let's go out and take a random couple decks out to see what the decks, how the decks are performing. That's where you will see some telltale is you'll see it normally in the traffic lane where the heavy vehicles travel. You'll have to start to see the deck start to cup uh, from the weight of the vehicles. But to see that you're talking very heavy mining vehicles that, you know, are probably not generally you're going to see too, 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 too much on a, on a bridge application. Uh, you know, I, we, I've seen it on a, on a, on a, in a uh, iron mine, but in the, but because the, because the, the uh, spillage from the vehicles were actually almost in abrasive on the deck and started to actually abrade the, uh, the steel, the deck steel away. <laughs> so that's where we started mm -hmm. seeing it. But that would be one telltale sign is if you start to see the deck to start to cup, you may want to take a look at that to uh, see. But I mean, you would have to be seeing, you know, tens of thousands of trucks like that a day going across a bridge uh, before you'd start to see something like that. So then that goes back to the, the average daily truck traffic I had mentioned, you know, you'd have to be up in the range of 25,000 a day before you'd have to really start being concerned about the deck fatiguing over some period of time. You know, if you've got less than that, it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But uh, almost every part of the bridge is visible either from the top or from below. Right. right. And uh, as far as the decking is concerned, as he said, you can actually remove a deck, turn it over, inspect it, and put it back. It is uh, uh, if an occasional checking is required. So uh, uh, the simplicity in construction makes it very easy to check other parts also. Mm -hmm. You would actually just just to just to put a point of reference, you would probably see fatiguing in the sway bracing and our secondary bracing before you would actually see the deck deck or panels to fatigue. Um, that's what you would see for it. You would actually see fatiguing in the if you remember in in the picture you saw some sway bracing that goes that's the for our wind. You'd probably see that fatigue first if anything. Uh, but again, unless you're seeing ten twenty five thousand you know heavy trucks a day. You, you, you're never going to see any of that type of, of uh, you know, damage occurring on, a, on a, one of our bridges. But when you have, uh, you know, a bridge like uh, at a place like Son Prayag, where majority of the load will be pedestrian loading and it will be a very heavy pedestrian loading, so the stress range will be quite high mm -hmm. because your live load component is quite significant. It will be right. even more than the regular load. As for the bridge, yes, for the bridge, not necessarily the deck. The deck is that that's light for the deck, but yes, the bridge, you're right. And it, that actually was the control we did the design for Sun Prayag. That was actually the controlling factor was the, um, was the pedestrian load, the pilgrimage pedestrian loading uh, when we looked at it. Uh, the one thing we would look at that too is we would look at the harmonic uh, frequency to make sure that the bridge was heavy yeah. enough where you wouldn't see it bouncing. And that bridge that we have up there is very, very heavy. And it would never, 
that bridge would never bounce due to, you know, harmonics due to people walking in step and, and things of that nature. So that was something that we, we looked at, especially in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think general, we, we are at 737 and already I can see that the number of participants is fast reducing. So it is, I think, time to conclude. Yeah, I, I, have, I have run through all the questions. Uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll take about 15, 20 minutes after this and reply to all of them. Uh, most of them are repetitive or things which they have asked initially and which was explained later. Okay. Uh, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, first of all, I would like to share that there are many bouquets for uh, John, for his excellent presentation. Thank I you. see the chat box full of compliments and also in Q&A box. So thank you very much for such oh, thank you. excellent no, I, thank you very for informative, very informative presentation. A lot of learnings. Uh, I mean, I definitely, I have learned a lot myself. And uh, uh, also there is a request that kindly uh, give handouts of your presentation. Many people have requested. So I would request you to kindly uh, give it to us so that we can mm -hmm. circulate to all the participants who have attended. Yeah, I'll, sure. yeah well, I'll, I'll get that over to you later today. I'll just, uh, when I, I'm going to go into the office shortly here and I will uh, do it from our office. It's just <laughs> the internet connection is better at the office than, than my home right this minute. Yeah, yeah, so sure, I'll, sure. I'll sure. do it Take when I get to the office later today. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank have you a nice evening. Much. And uh, wish you all a very happy new year once again. You too. And thank I also thank to all the participants for their patience. Thank you.